Hello everyone, I'm here with Seattle City Council member Shama Sawant representing the 3rd District of the City of Seattle. She was elected back in 2013 and ever since she was elected as the first socialist in I think over 100 years to serve on Seattle City Council, there's been constant efforts from capitalist forces, big business to take her down, but in spite of all of the opposition, she's been incredibly successful. She led the charge to pass the first in the nation minimum wage of $15 an hour. She led the charge to pass the first in the nation ban on chemical weapons used for crowd control against protesters, a lot that we saw during the George Floyd protests. And she did a lot of other things. And now the latest effort after Amazon spent $1.5 million to take her down in 2019 and failed at that, now the right in the city of Seattle Seattle's elites are trying to take her down with a recall effort with four charges in particular. Here to talk about that is Councilwoman Shama Sawant. Uh, Councilwoman, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Your case here is really interesting because you have you have not been deterred. You've had nothing but nonstop opposition, not just from the right, but from the Democratic Party establishment as well. You know, the, the mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, is a Democrat. So you have fought tooth and nail against these attacks and you would think that that would kind of knock somebody off their course but you've been really successful and i think that you you've been one of the most effective members of city council throughout the country and i, I think that what happens here is a microcosm of what could happen for the broader national and even international socialist movement so can you talk a little about a bit about the opposition that you faced especially with regard to this latest uh obviously bogus recall effort. It's not the first time, as I alluded to. I also want to note that you have faced uh, dozens of ethics complaints, all of which are bogus. You faced defamation lawsuits because you referred to um, killings by police as murder, Che Taylor in particular in Seattle. Uh, so talk about this latest effort to basically uh, stop you from uh, changing Seattle for the better. As you correctly said, Mike, ever since we were first elected in 2013, and of course, we won the first re-election in 2015 and our second re-election in 2019, despite the concerted efforts by Amazon and big business. And I would say also the city's democratic establishment to try and drive socialists out of City Hall. They didn't succeed in that effort. And now they're trying a do-over of the election result that they did not like in 2019 because there is no reality to the charges that they have leveled against me. And in fact, it's actually concerning especially in the context of heightened right populism and the far right riots at the Capitol building in Washington DC, the emboldening of a certain current of right wing, the death threats against uh, left elected officials like AOC and Ilhan Omar and Cori Bush. I've had death threats directed against me recently and the Seattle police have done virtually nothing to address those threats, to figure out where they're coming from. And so, the recall effort against us is happening in this context where the legitimacy of the capitalist system is at an all-time low. Young generations are looking for an alternative to this rotten system because especially the pandemic, but in general, the system has exposed itself as completely incapable of addressing even basic needs of humanity. Look at the crisis with vaccination, the pandemic, let alone larger questions of the climate catastrophe, for example. And so in this context, it is important from the ruling class's standpoint, it's important that they try to uh, attack the left, but especially the socialist left. And most importantly, their need is to attack any successful examples where movements have fought back and won. I mean, it's bad enough if you have the courage and the audacity to fight back. But if you win, you should expect that the ruling class, the democratic establishment, big business, the right wing will come after you. And these recall charges are happening in that context. And I would say they are really an example of how they, what they fear is and what they hate, what the ruling class hates is not only the actual victories we have won, which is making Seattle the first major city to win the $15 minimum wage. We just won the historic Amazon tax on big businesses to fund social housing and a Green New Deal. We have won a whole series of renters' rights that were thought impossible to win before we were we were elected. But what they fear most of all is not just these individual victories, which they would like to roll back, of course, and we know that they will attempt to roll back many of these if they succeed in the recall effort. But what they uh, fear most of all 
is the example that we have set that it is possible for movements and not just movement, but the socialist movement to get organized win its own office in the midst of political domination by the corporate ruling class, win victories despite the onslaught of their opposition, and then spread that example throughout the nation. $15 an hour went nationwide, and now the Biden administration is being forced to talk about it. That's what they fear the most, the example of the um, emboldenment of ordinary people, of working class people, and also the concrete uh, vision that we have shown that you can fight if you get organized in democratic movements where rank and file are empowered. That is how we won the tax Amazon victory. Uh, and so it's it's crucial that the ruling class push back against this and for for them for for to to defeat the uh, future efforts of movements. And I, I can say with a lot of confidence that if they succeed in this recall effort against us, they will not stop there. They will go after the socialist left and the broader left. Uh, and uh, that's why everybody, all of us have a stake in, uh, in uh, defeating this recall. Yeah, and I want to just point everyone to an article that you uh, wrote for Jacobin. This was published in, I think, November of last year. Um, it's titled, Democrats and the Right are Attacking Me and Left Movements Everywhere. I would highly encourage everyone to read this article because it, she really goes through um, extensively how they've been attacking her consistently. Um, and, and really, with Seattle, it, it's really interesting because this is where Amazon is, is headquartered. Um, you have the mayor of Seattle. She took $350,000 from Amazon, I believe, when she was elected in 2017. You see Amazon funding uh, to the tune of over a million dollars a campaign against the Socialist City Council member. I mean, this entire city has been captured by big business. And you have kind of like forced everyone to take their masks off to where even the Democratic Party establishment in Seattle is attacking you and coming after you. And the only way that you've really managed to uh, hold that seat and hang on to power is by really utilizing the grassroots. And I think that the way that we are successful here and we stop this effort is by standing in solidarity with you and activating the grassroots. So can you tell us what we can do um, if we live in Seattle or somewhere else in the country? How do we stop this recall effort? What can we do to help this cause? Because we want to have uh, that seat remain in your control because you're already doing so much. And as you said, like the $15 an hour minimum wage that Biden's administration is proposing, uh, this is kind of being modeled after what you all did in Seattle, which <laughs> they don't they don't want to see this because success, it, it kind of leads to like a domino effect. We've seen this time and again. Uh, we're seeing it with, you know, marijuana legalization. So the last thing they want is for you to make more progress and then pressure other cities and even, you know, Congress to act. So how do we stop this? I think you're right uh, about what you said in terms of the domino effect. Even look at the what happened in the recent election. Florida, which decisively went for Donald Trump, and that's a dangerous trend. The, these are the same voters, some of those same voters who also voted in the $15 minimum wage in that same election. What that shows you is how, what's at stake for us you know, in defeating this recall, but also oh, the larger goal of why there's an urgency to build the left is not only because there is a real potential with especially the younger generations getting politicized to win real victories like Medicare for all and a Green New Deal, although there will be uphill fights, but it also, the Florida example also shows that in reality, so many millions of working people who might have voted for Trump are actually going to be open to a real working class strategy of fight back be and it's in the absence of any real left alternative that they end up becoming fodder for Donald Trump's right reactionary ideology. And so the best way really of stemming the increasing tide of right populism is for us to urgently build a strong left and a socialist left nationally. And defeating the recall attempt here is part of that national effort. And so regardless of where you live, whether it's in Seattle or somewhere outside Seattle, please go to shamasolidarity.org. That's my first name, K-S-H-A-M-A, solidarity.org, to get more information about our campaign, our, as you said, grassroots campaign to defeat this recall attempt. And if you live in Seattle, 
we absolutely want your help more directly right now because of the lockdown with phone banking and reaching people in a socially distant way. But later, we will need a door knocking and face-to-face -face effort, again, socially distanced way to keep make sure we're, uh, we're keeping everyone safe. But nationally, if you're not in Seattle, then we do need your efforts with fundraising. So please send us your individual donations. But also, if you're able to host a fundraiser where you are, please contact our campaign and we will absolutely help you set it up. And we'll have all of the links to that down in the description box down below, as well as on the and, screen as well. And, and also, I would say, uh, please uh, reach out to left leaders, labor leaders, social movement leaders in your area and urge them to publicly endorse our solidarity campaign because it's that kind of public solidarity that we are going to need to help ordinary people in our district who are ultimately going to be voting on this recall for them to understand that the left is united on this and that an attack against Shama Sawant is not an attack against her personally, but an attack on the left overall, an attack on working people, and that if the recall goes ahead, it will be a setback for all of us. And so I, I'm really happy that uh, important uh, leaders and people who have sacrificed themselves for decades, like Noam Chomsky, have endorsed our campaign. Labor leaders like Sarah Nelson have endorsed our campaign. DSA elected leaders like Julia Salazar in New York, Mike Connolly in Boston, and Byron Sikcho Lopez and Rosanna Rodriguez in Chicago, who are Chicago elected aldermen, they've all publicly pledged their support for our campaign. We need that kind of support from leaders nationwide. Yeah, this is what solidarity looks like. I think that if you have um, members of Congress even with really large platforms, such as members of the squad, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, if she were to come out and use this uh, platform to draw attention to this, it really could make wonders uh, in terms of change. So this is really what solidarity is all about. Uh, I wanted to pick your brain for a little bit because you've been so successful. And I kind of saw your strategy as a mini version of the strategy that Bernie Sanders was running on. Like he always stated that if he were to be elected president, unfortunately, that didn't happen, but he would be the organizer in chief. And he'd take the grassroots movement to the White House. And that's basically what you've done at the city council level. So I think that you being as effective as you have been, you have a lot of insight into strategy. Um, so I wanted to ask you from an individual standpoint, as you know, just people who are consumers of political news, what we do to uh, affect change. Should we sign up for organizations? Should we work for campaigns? And then I also want to pivot to at the congressional level, because lately there's been a lot of talk about force the vote and members of the squad potentially withholding votes to uh, to uh, basically force a vote on Medicare for all. Uh, and this is over, but I still think that it's an important conversation to have because we're all trying to figure out what the correct strategy is going forward and how we actually can affect change. And you being able to affect change using the grassroots to kind of uh, feel you, I think you have a lot of insight here. So can you kind of speak to that? Yes, I think that's a, a key question that people have to grapple with. How is it that we were able to win these victories? And is it true that you can only do this locally, you can't do this nationally? I think I would first of all reject that false dichotomy. I think it's a question of strategy, no matter whether you're talking about local movements and local demands or nationally issues like Medicare for all, like a Green New Deal and ending fossil fuel use nationwide. I think that we are at a, we are at a time when when a lot of uh, Democrats also use similar sounding movement language where they will also say, I'm part of a movement. They will occasionally also maybe show up at strike picket lines. And I think we have to understand that there is a fundamental difference between what the Democratic Party offers and what we have accomplished in Seattle as a socialist alternative elected office, where, as you were saying, we, we have specifically used a movement building approach for our office. And that means a very specific thing. And I really agree that Bernie Sanders uh, would, would have been, uh, you know, it, it, that, that is where people wanted to go. Uh, and the fact that the Democratic establishment fought him tooth and nail shows which side they are on, really, because he would have defeated Donald Trump. And not only that, he would have gone far, far, far the more by saying, you know, by as he said, he would be an organizer in chief. But what we have done here 
is not just use the movement language in order to co-opt it and to sort of deceptively use the grassroots in order to carry on the status quo of corporate politics while uttering some kind and compassionate words. What we have done is in a concrete way, used our office to build social movements, to build larger movements alongside rank and file labor, non-unionized workers, socialist and community members. And, and that also goes into the question of force the vote, and I'll come, that, come to that in a second. But I just wanted to give a couple of concrete examples of what I mean when I say genuinely building movements. So when I was first elected in 2013 and I took office in 2014, the Democrats on the city council, and, and we should keep in mind, it's not just the mayor of Seattle that's Democrat, all the other eight council members are part of the Democratic establishment. I'm the lone socialist. And so when I was elected, the Democrats on the city council made it very clear that in private conversations and also with their public statements often that we were not going to win the $15 minimum wage, which was the main demand that we ran our campaign on and that city hall ran on their terms. And yet six months later, we had won $15 an hour. And those same council members had been forced to vote yes. And big business that had fought fiercely against the $15 minimum wage were forced to back down, at least on that demand. And the way we did that was soon after I was elected, I and myself and Socialist Alternative, our organization, many left labor unions, together we launched the 15 Now grassroots movement. Now, it was not a coincidence that we won 15, we established 15 Now and that we won $15 minimum wage. 15 Now and Socialist Alternative and rank and file left labor organizers were the backbone of winning $15 an hour. And so what we did through the 15 Now movement was we launched uh, action conferences citywide. We launched neighborhood action groups. We activated ordinary people to come and fight for this, explaining to them why it is important that their involvement mattered and that it was not going to, go, it was not going to be possible for me alone to fight on this and win this, that my real strength came from ordinary people marching on the streets in the 15 now rallies, but also coming to City Hall, bringing, this was pre-COVID, remember? So, you know, people could actually come uh, and uh, organize inside City Hall. And so we really completely changed the dynamic in City Hall. It used to be this ivory tower where pro-big business council members would sit and have polite conversations without any workers and not in the interest of workers. We completely upended this kind of pro big business ivory tower and we brought the people's voice into city hall it was the similar way in which we won all the renters rights we have won and also the amazon tax that we won last year i mean again it was no coincidence that we won the amazon tax in the thick of the black lives matter movement last year because it was that movement that really put pressure on the democratic establishment and they had to make all kinds of promises which they have since walked back but on the Amazon tax, they were forced to actually pass a city council Amazon tax because a specific tactic that we used in our tax Amazon movement was to have the threat of a ballot initiative, but not just a ballot initiative in name, but a viable threat of a ballot initiative. And we did that by collecting 30,000 signatures on the tax Amazon ballot initiative, 20,000 of which were collected at directly at the George Floyd protest at the rate of a thousand a day. That gives you the tremendous support we had in the grassroots, especially among black and brown working people for this kind of tax. Basically the idea that all these big businesses that have profited from this city's prosperity at the expense of workers need to pay at least a minimum tax in order for us to be able to afford social housing and Green New Deal programs. And I will mention that we used the same strategy in Tax Amazon movement that we did in 15 Now, which is we launched a grassroots movement that was genuinely democratically organized. We had action conferences, each of which was attended by hundreds of community members, labor union members, non-unionized workers, and even progressive small business owners, faith leaders. And we debated all the important points of the movement in those action conferences openly and all members of the action conferences they voted on all those important points when was the last time the democratic party establishment invited you or me 
to a grassroots meeting where we got to vote on the things that affected us. And so that that example of a democratically organized movement where even the informally appointed movement leaders were held accountable to the rank and file of the movement, that's what's important. So I think that shows how concretely this is different from the movement type language that many now progressive Democrats have started to use. And I think the challenge really should be that it's not enough to say you are on the side of movements. What are you actually doing to build those movements? And on top of that, I think this also requires, and this is how we are also fundamentally different than the Democratic Party, is that we use our position not to, you know, on the one hand, say we are on the side of working people, then on the other hand, be uh, giving cover to the establishments for all their betrayals. No, we don't do that. We speak, we use our office to speak openly about the betrayals that they carry out and force them, we put pressure on them to then vote the right way because then when we build that movement using our seat, it extracts a political price from them for voting the wrong way by betraying working people. And I think that connects to the question on force the vote because I don't, contrary to how it was presented, I don't think that the reluctance and ultimately uh, opposition to that kind of tactic where, you know, hold the democratic establishment, including Nancy Pelosi, oh, publicly accountable on a Medicare for all. Uh, I don't think that the disagreement from the squad and some of the DSA leaders, that it was a disagreement on individual tactics. Now, obviously, debates on tactics are completely fair and necessary on the left. Absolutely, we should be doing that. But I don't think this was based on a tactical disagreement. I think this was based on a fundamental disagreement of the what we believe is a fundamental need, which is to have head-on combat and bold challenge to the democratic establishment. Because we feel that this conflict is completely unavoidable if we hope to win any kind of reforms like Medicare for all, let alone deeper change. And I'll mention, you know, it's not as if uh, Congress members like AOC don't understand what we're talking about. I mean, when she was asked why why vote for the Trump impeachment if everybody is on your side already, what she said, and I agree with her, she said sometimes these votes create real political pressure that forces developments. Sometimes we vote for the historical record to let future generations know we did everything we could. I agree with every word of that. But what's missing here is uh, on the on the same co Congress members part, the willingness to direct that same challenge to the edifice of the Democratic establishment and corporate stalwarts like Nancy Pelosi. And I think that's where the real challenge lies. Uh, we don't have to uh, really, uh, the test is not whether they are against Donald Trump. They're obviously against Donald Trump and we all should be and we should be building the left to counter the rise of the right uh, wing and right populism. But the only way we will be able to do that is if we also put our elected leaders to the additional test, which is the key test, is are you willing to take on the conflict with the democratic establishment? Yeah, I think you're really speaking to one of the main grievances that a lot of, on the left have with members of the squad. Um, and, and the way that I kind of gauge how to support someone running for Congress, because I bring on a lot of people running for Congress, is I, I look at their platform. And if they check all the boxes, they support Medicare for All, Green New Deal, you know, a decriminalizing drugs, sex work, all that, then I think, okay, this is great. But I think that all of this event, uh, the events leading up to force the vote, and also before that as well, it kind of led a lot on the left to reevaluate what we look for in a leader. And it does require more than just being correct on the policies. It really does require you to fundamentally challenge leadership. And that's one thing that's lacking. I don't know, like, I don't necessarily believe that this is a character flaw with members of the squad. What I think is lacking, and you can kind of like um, help me out with this in your take, is I think that what's lacking is that there is this disconnect between members of Congress and the grassroots. And, you know, after you use the grassroots to get you elected, you fundraise, you know, using small dollar donations, once you get to Congress, the movement building is over. Like, it seems as if, like, the movement has accomplished its goal. We got this individual who agrees with us elected, but then that's it. And I think that what you really uh, demonstrate is that you have to keep building the movement. Like, getting to Congress and using the grassroots, that's really only step one. That's just the very beginning, because if you don't keep that movement activated and grow it, then the amount of power that you have as a member of Congress will be diminished, especially when you're facing, you know, these Democratic 
Democratic Party leaders who have a lot of institutional power, who have the media on their side and capitalist forces on their side. So is that kind of like, do you think that that describes the main issue? Because I, I would totally agree that my main criticism is that I want to see members of the squad really take on Democratic Party leadership. And it's a little bit frustrating because the only members of Congress that actually do challenge leadership seem to be the more conservative Democrats. Um, and it, usually they don't they don't get marginalized in the way that we fear the left would. So do you think like if you could give any advice to members of the squad, uh, given your experience, what do you think they would need to do to actually get us Medicare for all? Like, are they being too savvy trying to play 8d chess with leadership and you know butter up leadership and get them to not hate them like what do you think they need to do because i think this is really important because the ultimate goal the reason why we're putting folks in congress is to actually get change so what would be the main thing that you would change or the main piece of advice that you give to aoc cory bush and other members of the squad i think it's uh, first of all i think it's crucial that we are living in a time when in order to be, in order to have any kind of progressive credentials, the times have changed enough and consciousness has advanced enough that even Democrats are having to check, as you said, check all the boxes. And now the Democratic Party has a genuine uh, elected representatives who consider themselves left or socialist. And so I don't, I don't question the genuineness of the intent of many of these Congress members who have been elected who are now called the sw squad. I think it was uh, really a positive step forward that so many of them have gotten elected through not taking any corporate money. You know, that that really uh, the campaign, especially of Bernie Sanders in 2016, really set this, you know, it sort of set the watermark of what what actually constitutes even a basic idea of who's progressive, let alone who's on the left. And so it is it is actually a step forward for our movements that it has put that that much pressure on politics in the United States that now uh, having to take only grassroots donations, having to say publicly that I support Medicare for all, I support a Green New Deal is a sort of a test for uh, elected officials to get the support of the younger generation and of the left. Uh, but I think what it shows also is that you cannot just stop there. You also have, as you said, very. it was spot on what you said, which is that uh, as long as you have elected representatives, however genuine, let's not question their intentions, as long as you have elected representatives who believe that once they enter office, they have to limit themselves to whatever is possible while not making the democratic establishment angry at them, that is a dead end. As long as you have elected representatives who think that that is the way to go. It doesn't matter how well-intentioned they are. So I don't think we should be having a debate on whether Agreed. or not AOC is well-intentioned. I truly believe she is well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. As you said earlier, Mike, this is a question of strategy for the left. So let's uh, let's not make this about, uh, you know, I don't think the left should be engaging in debate about whether or not uh, she is well-intentioned. The question is, is she willing to do what it will take to win Medicare for All? And that's why... As, as I said uh, earlier, the question is not to her. The question is to ordinary people. What are how are we going to get organized in order to make sure that those elected officials who run as progressives then go into office and don't think that this is about them trying to curry favor with Nancy Pelosi or any even the middle layer of the Democratic establishment. And I think uh, the other thing that you said actually is quite perceptive, where you said that it seems to you that mostly the challenge that Nancy Pelosi gets, such as it is, comes from more conservative members of the Democratic Party, not from the left of the Democratic Party, and how they seem to don't get marginalized. Well, the reason the conservatives don't get marginalized is because they have the entire capitalist ruling class on their side. They are speaking for Wall Street. Yes, they don't get marginalized, and they are bold precisely because they have the entire might of the billionaire class and the multimillionaires and the millionaires and also of the right wing on their side. So that poses a concrete question. What are we, our elected officials, going to have on your side? And that's the question that we have answered so successfully in Seattle, where we went in crystal clear with zero illusions 
that somehow I myself with just my personal qualities and my determination and my courage and my self-sacrifice, I am going to win over the democratic establishment. No, I mean, obviously, personal characteristics are truly important. I won't I won't minimize them. But uh, the most important thing that's different about us compared to the squad, for example, is that we understood from day one that the the other politicians, you know, the Democratic Party politicians on the city council have big business and the entire might of the ruling class on their side, which means the only way we will be able to change this completely ruthless status quo of balance of forces is we have to have forces on our side. And where do those forces come from? The actual movement, ordinary people on the ground. And so the only way we will win Medicare for all, for example, is if we have a similar strategy at the national level that we had in Seattle to win $15 an hour, Amazon tax and all the renters' rights victories, we have won, where we understood that our role, our entire role, is to unambiguously and unabashedly build the strength of movements. And that that includes calling out Democrats when they betray. So in other words, uh, voting for Nancy Pelosi is a non-starter. The left in Congress, especially now, because numerically they hold the balance of vote, for them, they should not be voting for Nancy Pelosi. They should be actually fighting, building a real fight back against the Democratic establishment. But the only way they will be able to do it and not get marginalized is if they understand that they have to concretely build movements. So in other words, we built a 15 now grassroots movement. We built the tax Amazon grassroots movement. Similarly, we will need a Medicare for all grassroots movement where AOC and the squad members are actually calling for national actions, calling for a march to Washington, calling for action conferences uh, in multiple cities throughout the nation where ordinary people, progressive labor unions, Many other left leaders can stand on their side and really uh, create a dynamic where far from being marginalized, you could, the left in Congress could actually put serious pressure that Nancy Pelosi's establishment, not to mention the Republican Party, would come to fear. But that is not going to happen as long as we have the left, no matter how genuine that is, thinking that they have Uh, They have only so much room to maneuver and that they have to, at the end of the day, vote for Nancy Pelosi. Look, this this is another form of lesser evilism. And lesser evilism, in my view, is a permanent defensive posture for the left. If we if we adopt lesser evilism, then its logic is endless. No year, no month, no day will be the right time for you to go up against the establishment. So we have to dispense with lesser evilism and understand that, you know, 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. How are we going to win them over? It is by building mass movements around demands that they will agree with, many of them will agree with us on. Medicare for all, green new jobs, ending renter debt, which is now becoming a huge crisis, ending student debt, and really building that grassroots effort. Yeah, I think that really you are hitting on all the points and answering the questions that we've kind of been asking ourselves. Like for me, I've, I've been trying to wonder and and like reassess my theory of change after Bernie Sanders lost the primary in 2020 and thinking like, how do we ever get to this point to where we we can get Medicare for all? You know, um, I don't think we're going to abolish capitalism anytime soon, but at least rein it in a little bit more and move closer and closer towards social democracy for now. Um, And I think that really the question uh, or the answer, rather, it's always been right in front of us. It's not a matter of like, well, how much more members of the squad do we need to start, you know, flexing our muscle in Congress. Do we need four more, 10 more? It's a matter of we need uh, (laughs) movements. We need people to be activated. And, you know, to me, I think it's as little uh, or simple as really even organizing people in your own communities. If we all do this, then we could have a huge effect at the aggregate level. It's just a matter of like trying to relearn bad behaviors, because I think that a lot of us, myself included, we've been kind of like hyper focused on electoral politics from the standpoint of like elections and politicians. And I think it makes sense why we focused on that, because we were this close to the White House. So it's like when you have almost, you know, um, the most amount of power in this system, you know, it makes you feel as if a lot more things are, are possible. But you kind of have to go back to the drawing board once that 
you know, is out of the question and think, how do we actually get the change? And it's going to come from, you know, the bottom up and not the top down. And I think that if people really internalize that and they use that to guide themselves, you know, going forward to fight for change, then I think everything will be, um, it's not going to be smooth, uh, to say the least, but I think that it'll make more sense um, to have that perspective. I, I would say, though, that uh, I don't I don't believe that we were this close to uh, getting Bernie Sanders elected. I, I, it's two things. One, mm. were there tens of millions of people absolutely electrified by his message of a political revolution against the billionaire class? Absolutely, yes. Was there a real opening for the left? Absolutely, yes. But... Was it going to happen through the Democratic Party? No. In fact, when he, when Bernie Sanders, you know, a, a socialist alternative, my organization and I, we supported Bernie Sanders both in 2016 and and last year, and I've spoken at his rallies, you know, campaign rallies both times. But when he was about to announce his candidacy in 2016, uh, in a at a public forum on, on the climate change in New York City in Manhattan, I asked him publicly to run not as a Democratic Party candidate, but as an independent candidate. And obviously he didn't agree and he ran as a Democrat. And I think it's a very simple uh, calcul uh, it's very simple calculation here. If you were run in a party that whose establishment is aligned with the billionaire class, how can that be the party that will tolerate a campaign against the billionaire class? It is as simple as that. It's not uh, you know, we should we should uh, we should understand that this is this is the essence of politics, and this is something all working people can understand. It is not something that's inaccessible to them. You don't have to have a PhD to get a very simple fact. It's a question of you know what logic you're following, and I think one of the main components of why we were able to do it differently and show a different example is because I am not part of a party. I'm not a member of a party that is opposed to the agenda that I'm running on, which is for the working class. I am a part of socialist alternative, which itself is, you know, it's a, it's a socialist organization that is made up of rank and file activists who are all have democratic rights within the organization, who discuss and debate all important questions such as should we run a candidate, who the candidate should be, what the campaign platform should be. It is not done by one elite individual. Uh, and furthermore, socialist alternative itself is rooted in the wider social movement. Our members are members of the working class. They are women. They are people of color. They are ordinary people. They're grocery store workers, Amazon warehouse workers, tech workers, educators, librarians. These are these are the people who are rooted in the social movement themselves. I myself, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher by profession. I'm an economist and teacher by profession, and I'm a member of the teachers union. And so uh, I think all of the questions that you raised, Mike, they bring up the one of, I think, the most important point, which is that in Seattle, socialist alternative and me being part of socialist alternative has been the absolute backbone of everything we have been able to achieve. Because having an own, my own organization with me, an organization furthermore that is rooted in the working class, makes sure that I am never alone. I may be one in on the dais with eight other democratic establishment people who may oppose me on or attempt to oppose the working class agenda that we bring forward, but what they are going up against is not just me. They're going up against socialist alternative and the working class that socialist alternative is rooted in. And so really many of the uh, questions of organizing for Medicare for all also bring up the question of are, uh, how can we do that with, inside the Democratic Party? Uh, in my view, we need a new party for the working class, a party that is not organized, as you said, not organized top down, but is democratically organized, where actually not as an aspiration, but actually members of that party can hold their elected officials accountable. But not only that, a party that is rooted in social movements and is not just simply an election running machine. So I want to pick your brain on this a little bit, um, if if you have a little bit more time, because I actually disagree. Uh, I don't think that Bernie Sanders should have run outside of the Democratic Party, even if I wanted that to happen, and even if he wouldn't have those institutional barriers that prevent change. The problem is that, and I've kind of gone back and forth on this over the last couple of years, is even though at the local level, I think it is possible to, to subvert Duverger's law, how... 
how can we do this? Um, how do we actually get a third party to be viable given our majoritarian electoral system? Because I, I was of the thinking, and this was my reasoning in 2016 for supporting the Green Party, is that you know, maybe it's the case that if we can get the Greens to 5%, they'll get national funding, and that will kind of get the ball rolling. But what I realize is that, like, the two-party duopoly in the United States, it's almost, like, culturally ingrained. And so I feel like people, even leftists, will check out if you just mention, like, a third party. And I think the answer to that is electoral reform first. Because in order to have, like, a multi-party system or an alternative to what is basically, I mean— one party rule if we're talking about capitalism in the United States is you have to have institutions that allow for proportional representation. So what do you say to um, folks like me who think Bernie was right to run in the Democratic Party because that was the only way for him to actually win. But then when he's in as president, you can change the institutions. Like, how do we how do we subvert Duverger's law? Was, is that possible? Actually- it wasn't actually a way to win because they didn't let him win, right? I mean, sure. What 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 evidence would uh, anybody use to prove the po- hypothesis that running the, the to the Democratic Party is the only way you can win? But you didn't win, so sure. What's the evidence? Uh, but I would say that you know, just starting from your original point about electoral reform. Obviously, you know, there are pros and cons of different electoral systems, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't want to start a debate on those. But what I will sure. say, what I will offer is, you know, I, my home country, India, has the kind of system that you're, electoral system that you're talking about, proportional representation. And what do we have in India? We don't have just two parties. We have multiple parties. And yet, what have we seen in the same period, you know, in the same three, four decade period, what we have seen is not one of those parties actually fighting for the working class. In fact, many of the parties that used to be somewhat left-leaning or progressive have actually moved to the right, and the more right-leaning parties have now become you know, absolutely fundamentalist and somewhat deadly to, uh, to even basic ideas like democracy, as you're seeing with the BJP and the Modi regime. Right. And so... I don't know. I don't actually believe that this is a, you know, this comes down to electoral reform in the sense that if we fix this or that electoral law, then we will be able to run left campaigns and get somebody to win as president in, you know, some somebody like Bernie Sanders. I don't actually believe that. And and going back to my um, account of how when I asked Bernie Sanders, uh, that was in November of 2014, I believe, in Manhattan, the day before the big People's Climate March. Uh, that I believe you should run as an independent because I don't believe that running inside a party that is off the billionaire class will allow you to run a political revolution against the billionaire class. And Bernie Sanders' response was something along the lines of, well, I don't want to run an educational campaign. You know, I don't want to run a campaign just for the sake of it. I want to win. And my response to that is, of course, Yes, absolutely, we want to win. We've won three elections as an independent socialist in Seattle. So absolutely, we are about winning. The left has to win, especially with the ticking clock of climate catastrophe. Mm -hmm. We have no time to mess around. We have to be very, very serious about winning. But this is the point. The Democratic Party has proven what we, Socialist Alternatives, said in 2014, that they will never allow... Bernie Sanders' working class agenda to become that party's agenda because that party is controlled by billionaire interests, by fossil fuel lobby, by all the powerful interests that are completely hostile to even minor reforms, let alone an actual socialist vision as an alternative to capitalism. So the problem here is uh, that we we will be stuck on, in this hamster wheel of right. running a left campaign inside the Democratic Party every four years now that you know now that Bernie Sanders has opened that road and and losing again and again as long as we think that this is about running that one you know magic presidential campaign once in some four year period and winning and again maybe that changing everything I don't think it is going to work that way at the end of the day I think it is a question of seeing this through the lens of a longer term movement building approach and not understanding that this one election is not going to be the result of anything. I mean, I will also say this, 
even if Bernie Sanders were to win, I don't believe that it could win inside the Democratic Party. But even if he were to win, do you think that they would just allow him to do all the things that he wants to do oh, for the working all. class? Exactly. So my point is that this temptation that I, I completely I'm completely compassionate to this idea, but I'm what I'm trying to point out that it's it's a dead end, which is that it's understandable that people believe that well, building a new party from scratch that just seems utopian, that just seems too daunting. Let's try something that seems less daunting, which is do it to the Democratic Party. I understand the temptation to go that route because something else seems more daunting. My counter to that is actually not only is the Demo running the democratic establishment route just as daunting because look at the kind of attacks and chicanery that they used to destroy Bernie Sanders' campaign, which they absolutely did. And yeah. we predicted that they would do it, that it would be uh, just as daunting. In fact, Thinking working class agenda can succeed inside the Democratic Party, that's utopian in my view. So there's no avoiding a massive class struggle type of clash. And I mean, I don't mean physical clash, I mean a political clash right. between the haves and the have nots, the people who have the um, incentive to keep this rotten system intact, which is the billionaire class and their political cronies, and the billions in this world who have every reason to urgently bring about a social shift. There is no avoiding that political clash. That political clash is going to happen one way or another. And the sooner we understand that as long as we keep ourselves beholden to a party that is controlled, not by us, but by the billionaire class, we, that is going to run into a dead end. So it's never going to be easy. Isn't it? I'm not trying to sell this idea that if you, it's going to be easy to build a new party. No, I promise you, when we do build that new party, I promise you that there will be all kinds of hostile elements who will become part of that party and then try to use that party's platform to further their own, own careers. So we should not expect, and this is the main point I'm trying to make, we should never expect that it's ever going to be easy. It is going to be hard. The question is, which is the right way to go? Which is the way that's going to yield us the most results? And this is where I'll come you know, full circle to Bernie Sanders' response. He said something like, I don't want to run an educational campaign. And my response to that was, well, you are not going to be able to win inside the democratic establishment for the simple reason that they will not let you win. They will use every trick in the book to undermine you, which is exactly what they did. And on top of that, you will send a wrong education of, you know, it won't even be the right kind of educational campaign where the message, you know, the right kind of educational campaign is our campaigns, where we say openly and honestly to ordinary people hard. this is the way to go we can we can do it it's not going to promise you that it's going to be a rosy path but this is the only way that will yield results the last point i'll say in in response to your very important question is that i think we should also stop uh, engaging in this what i feel is the false dichotomy between local and national politics any idea that the democratic establishment will let you do what you want for the working class locally is uh, is dispelled that idea is completely dispelled by looking at what, how, how hard they're going after my office. They have, as you said, they have attacked us in every which way. I have lost count of the number of lawsuits, the number of uh, attacks, you know, based on so-called ethics uh, that have uh, been done against us. In 2019, the Democrat, the progressive wing of the Democratic establishment, Latina council members, women. They ran a candidate against me in the primary. So the and now we are facing this recall attack. So my point is that there is no space where, whether it's local or national, that we will be able to build the left without an onslaught of attacks by the ruling class. And no, we are not going to win every battle we we take up. It's a question of which direction you're heading, though. That's the point. I think you make a lot of really compelling points. And you may be right that they would have never allowed Bernie to win because I'm recalling the times when we saw the discussions of them using superdelegates to basically steal the nomination away from him. In the event, he did get a plurality of uh, pledge delegates, but not an outright majority. 
Um, so I think that actually is a really compelling point. My my only issue is that I, I've been kind of like trying to broaden out my analysis and I kind of look at both of the parties as many institutions within a larger system, a capitalist system. And so in the event, let's say hypothetically speaking, Bernie Sanders were to win the presidency if he did pursue uh, a third party option. Don't you think that the same institutional mechanisms that would have kept him down um, if he ran within the Democratic Party would still exert that same pressure on him if he was outside the Democratic Party? Because he'll still be working with Democrats and Republicans in Congress. He'll have to caucus with them as an independent president. So I, I'm just trying to figure out, like, in terms of long term strategy, I, I kind of like my my theory of change has kind of been a two pronged approach. I think that you do have to try to take over the Democratic Party, even if that might be almost impossible. But I also think that third party alternatives are effective at putting pressure on the other parties because they can only get so out of step with their base until they start losing portions of that base to third parties. So I think that you you know using both to your advantage uh, when when it when it's effective is going to work. But how how do we like? I think this is kind of like speaking to a broader question um, of capitalism in general and like is capitalism allowing us to make the change at all and you've kind of answered that question in the sense that so long as you have movements really you can you can do whatever so long as that movement is activated and working class people are are brought into this process and not kind of sidelined to your first point wouldn't if if bernie sanders had run as an independent and if he had won and, and i think that is a loaded point because the only way he could have won is if we had a completely different situation here in the United States with movements genuinely empowered on a national level, like the small example that we've shown in Seattle, but it would have to be a hundred times over. Uh, so as far as your question, wouldn't wouldn't they have attacked him even if we, wouldn't the democratic establishment have attacked him even if he had run as an independent? Absolutely, they would have. And that's not a hypothetical question. Look at what they're doing in Seattle. Look at what the democratic establishment is doing in Seattle. I am not a Democrat. I am a socialist right. alternative member. I ran independent of the Democratic Party. There's been no shortage of attacks. I mean, as I said, I have lost count of the attacks they have made against my office. So I don't think the point of um, difference between whether you run as an independent or you run as a Democratic Party member is about how much they will attack you. What they are hostile to is if you are genuinely wanting to fight for the working class. Right. And Bernie Sanders is genuinely wanting to fight for the working class, which is why we supported him. And yes, that is precisely why the Democratic Party establishment will be utterly hostile to his agenda, whether he ran as a Democrat or as an independent. That's not the question. The question is, which is the way in which we can genuinely build the strength of the grassroots, or the strength of movements, of rank and file people, of millions of young people, is it going to be within the Democratic Party or is it going to be to build, to begin to build an independent force? And that's where I think the answer is latter, not turning everybody into this blind alley of the Democratic Party, which we know doesn't work because they are hostile to our agenda. That is why we need our own organization. And bottom line, again, the only way we have been able to do what we have done in Seattle is because I am not alone. I actually have a force with me, which is socialist alternative. That's the kind of difference it can make if you have your own party standing with you, because no individual, however extraordinarily gifted, is going to be able to do this on their own. So it doesn't matter how genuine and courageous Bernie Sanders is alone. He is not able to achieve it. And he's he's clear about that. He said he talked about being an organizer in chief. Where, where I disagree with him is, is, is that possible from inside the Democratic Party? And I don't believe that it will be. And at the end of the day, I think you also made an important point yourself, which is that as long as you are running inside the parties of capitalism, you cannot build a force against capitalism. I mean, it's as simple as that. And that is why what we need is a, a, a political organization that will be for and by the American working class, that will be tied to the rank and file of the labor movement, that can actually present a collective, you know, so organized challenge to the might of the capitalist class. And running uh, candidates from this, this kind of party will be part of the work that the party would do. And in reality, the most important point would be the party would be rooted in the working class and really build, helping to build movements. And I think 
uh, again, these these questions are uh, to be posed even to the squad, even if, even though they're they've run as Democrats. The question is, what is stopping them from, for example, launching national days of action for Medicare for all? Really building action conferences. We we organized Tax Amazon action conferences in Seattle. They can organize Medicare for all action conferences nationwide. Do you do you do we believe that there will be any shortage of enthusiasm on the part of ordinary people for something like that? No. Medicare for all is one of the most popular demands in the United States, including a huge proportion of Republican voters. And we are in the middle of the pandemic. Everybody who is on the ground wants Medicare for all. So what's stopping the squad from doing it is not any uh, suspicion that there's enough and that there may not be enough enthusiasm on the ground. What's stopping them at the end of the day is that they are afraid that if they did that, they would be completely, you know, that 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 would be the the sort of it's it's a call to arms, you know, it's a call to mm -hmm. action to the working class that is completely against what the democratic establishment wants. And it's not just Nancy Pelosi. It's you know, it's it's that whole group of them, uh, and many of them who even call themselves progressive. They are not going to agree with this. So at the end of the day, the only way that the squad could do this is if they had their own party with them. And that is why I'm saying that we need a new party because, uh, you know, the conservatives, the corporate uh, politicians, they have a very big force on their side, which is the capitalist class and the capitalist system itself. What do we have on our side? Millions and tens of millions of people. So unless we organize them in a serious way with a political organization that goes beyond just election years and is rooted in mass movements, we are not going to be able to achieve that. Yeah, I think this is really fascinating. And I've kind of been like, uh, I, I've been a both sides on this issue. Like I kind of like I think we should try both things at once. Like I think that try to take over the Democratic Party, try to form a new party, put pressure, uh, build up existing parties, organize. I think that at the end of the day, even though there's there's like a lot of disagreement on the left and it is somewhat divisive and it's dividing a lot of members of the left. One thing that I'm always willing to admit is that if we find a strategy that works, then I'm willing to abandon what I previously uh, knew. You know, I'll unlearn the bad habits. And I think that you certainly are coming from a place of legitimacy, uh, having been able to accomplish so much that didn't just change a lot of Seattle, but it's having an impact on the national political discourse. Because again, we're kind of seeing the Democratic Party copy your minimum wage model in Seattle, which you kind of spearheaded. So it's it's really interesting. And really, thank you so much for coming on. I've taken up way too much of your time. But I think that this recall effort is it's really important that we fight this. And just having you explain like what it takes to truly like get change is is it's just perfect. So thank you so much, Shama. Uh, can you tell us where we can find you online on Twitter um, and whatnot? Yes, for the Solidarity campaign against the recall attempt, please go to kshamasolidarity.org, which is my first name, K-S-H-A-M-A, solidarity.org. You can find my uh, council office stuff, you know, really interesting stuff on Twitter. My Twitter handle is CM Kshama, that is CM and my first name. And of course, you can just Google my name or you can Google Socialist Alternative and find out more information. Now, really welcome anybody who's watching this. If you have questions about socialist alternative or how we have conducted our work in the city council, uh, what it means to be a socialist, how we can win any of the victories that we're talking about, the necessary things like Medicare for all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I really appreciate you, Mike, for asking all those really important questions. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. It's nice to like have someone on who has done so much, like explain what it takes, because I, I think that like I I'm really... I've kind of like I went into this like doom and gloom mode after 2020 and it felt like everything was hopeless. But to really look to these examples of success in the United States, I think it shows that not all hope is lost, even in this late stage capitalist system like we can affect change. It's just a matter of like doing the right thing and most importantly, organizing, you know, talking to people. So thank you so much, Councilwoman Sawant. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Mike. And as you said, yes, it, it does feel like doom and gloom and it's completely understandable. I feel that way, too. Uh, and it's it's because there is a lot of, uh, you know, we see the system not working for us. But I think the thing that really makes me uh, feel better when I'm having one of those doom and gloom moments is when I remind myself of one simple logical reality, which is that if we don't fight, 
then we are facing doom and gloom. We have no option but to fight. And I think that should really help us remember that it is worth fighting for. This planet and humanity is worth fighting for. And what better what what better way there is to spend our life? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Beautifully put. Thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate it.